Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Advancing Equity in Rare Healthcare. My name is Katie Kowalski. I'm the Associate Director of Education at NORD, and it's my pleasure to be your facilitator for this meeting. Today's webinar is the second in a three-part series exploring the disparities faced by rare disease patients from underserved groups, and also discussing the role healthcare providers and health systems can play in addressing issues of health inequity. It's NORD's privilege to be working in partnership with the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition to produce these webinars. The Rare Disease Diversity Coalition, or RDDC, was formed to address the challenges that marginalized populations face obtaining diagnosis and accessing treatment for rare disorders. The coalition was started by the Black Women's Health Imperative, and its membership is comprised of healthcare nonprofits, patient advocacy groups, and industry experts. The RDDC aims to educate and empower rare disease patients of color, reduce the time between the onset of symptoms and diagnosis, and eliminate racial bias. We thank you, RDDC, for your contributions and your support. Before we begin, I'd like to share a brief announcement. Rare Disease Day, February 28th, 2022, is just around the corner. On Monday, February 28th, NORD will host a community gathering at 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time online. This is to celebrate the 12th annual Rare Disease Day. Please come show your stripes and join us for this exciting event, which will feature celebrity guest appearances, entertainment, and real-life patient stories. Find out everything NORD's doing for Rare Disease Day or reserve a spot for this free event by visiting rarediseaseday.us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. Dr. LaTanya Washington is the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Methodist North Hospital, where she leads medical affairs, medical staff recruitment, and patient care. She's also the President of Bluff City Medical Society, a premier organization for physicians of colors in the Memphis metropolitan area. Dr. Washington is board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and has held clinical roles in primary care, urgent care, emergency medicine, and hospital medicine, caring for both adult and pediatric patients. She's an active contributor and supporter of the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. We welcome you, Dr. Washington, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Katie. I have the privilege of being joined by three esteemed panelists. I will introduce each of them briefly. Dr. David Acosta is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the American Association of Medical Colleges. He provides strategic vision and leadership for the AAMC's diversity and inclusion activities across the medical education community. Dr. Kirk Campbell is a professor of medicine, the vice chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the director of the nephrology fellowship program at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Dr. Deborah Regeer is the director of genetic and genomic education at Washington, D.C.'s Children's National Medical Center, and she is an attending physician in genetics and metabolism and the primary investigator for Rare Disease Clinical Research Scholars Program. So I'm so excited that we'll have an opportunity to talk today about advancing equity in rare healthcare. We have a number of questions for our esteemed panelists, and this promises to be a rich conversation. So let's get started. So I'll start with Dr. Campbell. Um, this is this question is for you. So, Dr. Campbell, we understand that diversity is for more than diversity's sake. The point of encouraging diversity in hospitals or medical schools is not to have a diverse hospital or a diverse medical school, but rather it is to have a better hospital or medical school. Can you comment on how diversity will enhance the patient experience and the quality of care? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Washington. That's a great question. And I think that 
you know, we've learned uh, from outside uh, the, the healthcare sector and outside of medical schools uh, that entities in the corporate world and corporate America that are more diverse and inclusive uh, do better. They're more successful, right? Uh, we know that uh, market share increases, uh, uh, teamwork and, and team cohesion uh, are better. Uh, and ultimately, the, the, the mission of, of organizations uh, across the professional sphere are more likely to be fulfilled, right, uh, if they are diverse equitable and inclusive. And I think in, in the healthcare uh, setting and in, in academic medicine, it's really no exception. We, we know that uh, there are some patients that, for example, require uh, more resources, more time, right, uh, uh, in order uh, to ensure that we have uh, equitable outcomes uh, in a clinical setting. And ident identifying barriers to care for certain uh, populations is crucially important. Otherwise, we're gonna uh, leave some patients behind, right? Uh, when we're educating, uh, the next generation of, of physicians, whether we're talking about folks in medical school or in residency or fellowship training, we also need to make sure that we have a workforce, right, uh, that's responsive to the needs of the community. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we need uh, to make sure we're, we're recruiting our classes effectively and training physicians appropriately to de deliver culturally competent and humble care for the populations they ultimately serve. Uh, on the research end, right, uh, we, we obviously need to develop, uh, you know, new um, drugs and devices uh, to improve the health of, of our uh, population. And, and we need to make sure we're um, identifying and developing um, these innovative approaches that will reach uh, all sectors of the population, right? We know that the differences in drug metabolism, right, uh, based on, on ancestry, for example. We know that there are special uh, uh, genetic uh, diseases, right, that, that might be amenable to precision therapeutics and gene editing, for example. Um, and, and, you know, we, we obviously need to have an inclusive approach to our, our research uh, approaches and, and work as well. So, so I think whatever we're, we're, we're thinking about uh, clinical care education uh, or scientific inquiry, it's, it's very important um, to be diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Absolutely. Thanks so much um, for that input. So really kind of shifting gears and talking about um, medical education. Dr. Acosta, can you talk to us a little bit about what the current demographics are in U.S. medical school enrollment and what are the percentages of individuals that are considered underrepresented in medicine and how actually medical schools can promote more diversity in their enrollees? For 2021, when we break it down to different demographic uh, variables, such as uh, when we look at the gender, uh, we find that women for the third consecutive year, uh, make up the majority of applicants to medical school. Right now, they make up around 57% of all the applicants to medical school. And for those that get accepted for the third year in a row as well, uh, they make up the majority of those that actually matriculated or got into medical school at 55.5% actually gotten into medical school. So if I break it down by race and ethnicity, what we find is a couple of things that I think are really pertinent for today's um, discussion as well. When we look at the number of Black and African American applicants in 2021, we also saw an increase, which we're very excited about because we haven't seen this much of an increase in quite some time. There's a total of 7,331 applicants that were Black and African American, and that was up from about 5,100 um, applicants on a lot of attention to. When we look at the number of Hispanic Latino applicants in 2021, that also increased from 2020. It went from 5,820 uh, applicants to 7,280 in 2021. Um, they made up about 11.7% of all the applicants uh, that we saw. The downside from this is the number of American Indian and Alaskan natives in 2021. Um, the number of applicants was at 689. It is up from 561, but it's still much less than what we had anticipated uh, prior to. Now, if I shift this into, so how many actually matriculated or got into medical school when we look at those numbers? So out of the over 7,000 applicants of African-American and Black students, we find that essentially 2,562 got into medicine. Uh, they represent about 11.3% of all medical students uh, for 2021. It is, a, it is a significant jump from the past, but again, only about 813 
of that 2,562 were men that got into medical school. So as you see, we do have a national crisis with regards to that. When I look at Hispanic and Latinos that actually got into medical school in 2021, um, they uh, are up um, you know, from 12% last year to make up about 12.7% um, of all the um, <clears throat> matriculants to medical school this year. And Alaska Natives and, <clears throat> and American Indians um, represent only about 1%. Um, that's important when you begin looking at the U.S. population. The U.S. population is a reminder for everybody. When we look at the Black and African American population, I said that they represent about 11.3% of all the medical students that are in school. The U.S. population is made up of about 14% African Americans and, and Blacks in the, in the country uh, in 2020. For Latinos, they make up about 18.7% of the U.S. population. And as a reminder, uh, they represent only about 12% in medical school. Um, and uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives represent about 2% of the U.S. population. Uh, and presently in medical school, they make up um, just under 1% of that as well. So and you've asked an important question, Dr. Washington, that is, so what the heck can we do? you know, in order to improve this sort of thing. And we could probably have a whole conference that lasts a whole week to talk about these, but let me just highlight a few important things that I think are really important. I think number one on top of my list is that we have to ensure and increase the number of, of black indigenous and people of color faculty, role models and mentors. There's an adage that is so true and remains true, even now, and I can remember when I got into medical school 30 years ago, and that is, you know, if I can see it, I can be it. And having more role models and mentors that they can actually see what's possible is really important. And also really important, as we were discussing prior to this, was it's also really important about what's my role in taking care of people who have rare diseases as well. Because they're, that's not necessarily talked about at the stage of trying for when people are looking at their health careers or what's possible for me. They're usually given the typical thing of oh, surgery, pediatrics, family medicine, and some of the surgical specialties. But I think we also have to have role models and mentors um, in rare diseases as well to see, show, to basically make the point that you too can be this as well because we need you in this. Secondly, I think also the important piece about this is that. Um, Many of our medical schools today, and because this is a, an accreditation uh, element that all medical schools have to cover, have to have some type of a, a pathway program. We used to call them pipeline programs. Today, we call them health career pathway opportunities. And the important thing that I've seen being in this position now at the AAMC, it is so interesting to me that although most medical schools now, almost all of them have these pathway opportunities, it could either be for high school students or college students, the problem that I see is that the doors don't get open from their own admissions committee to accept those students that did those summer programs. You're finding some of these programs get into other prestigious medical schools elsewhere in the country, but are not getting into the, the particular school or institution that they did the pathway program at. And these are usually local kids, regional kids as well. I should say students, um, I'm showing my age here. Um, and respect for them, again, I think it's really important that you know, admissions begin to have open doors for those pathway students as well. Thirdly, you've heard about a holistic review process and admissions. You know, this is again, we need, they, most of these schools need to adopt uh, that holistic review process uh, and be able to think about um, the students' assets rather than their deficits. How do we tap their talent potential? Because word will get out once they know an institution is interested in who I am as a person and what assets I bring to the table as opposed to what deficits I bring will make a difference for these students as well. I think we also have to ensure, lastly, that we have that all of our learning environments and all of our medical institutions really look at trying to achieve to become an equitable, inclusive, and an anti-racist learning environment. Again, most of the students rely on each other when they hear stories about certain institutions. And so, number one, I think we've got to change that mindset that some of our faculty have and eliminate this presumed incompetence mindset that some of our faculty actually have about our URIM students and the associated consciousness and unconscious biases that they maintain. 
for example, such as, oh, you went to a community college. Oh, you're from a post-baccalaureate background, so you must not be as smart as some of the other students that we take. We have to change that mindset. I think that becomes really important. They also, we also have to understand the importance of cultural identity and its value amongst our underrepresented in medicine students. You know, assimilation um, to the white racial frame really rids our students of their identity and really insults, insults their dignity. That culture identity is just as important as a health profession's identity or a science identity as well. And then lastly, I think we need to eliminate those known inhibitors that we've already discovered through our research and that we've published, those inhibitors of success, the unique challenges and barriers that are uh, underrepresented minorities face, such as educating our faculty how to recognize isolation and marginalization when I suffer from imposter syndrome or stereotype threat and how it impacts my academic performance. Lastly, I would say that understanding what diverse students are looking for in medical schools is a really critical piece of this. You know, our generation of students now are just so further advanced. I doubt that I would even get into medical school nowadays. But the reality, they're looking for a curriculum that has, they know about population health now. They know about health equity. They know about social determinants of health. They know about um, all these facets of advocacy and leadership to become that next uh, important physician leader of the future. This is not something they learn in medical school because they're already learning it now in their undergrad years. Community engagement is on that list. Patient um, population exposure and experiences matter to them. So if you really want to enhance this, the reality is it's almost as you're just saying, like the field of dreams. If I build it, they will come. Pay attention to what they're really looking for. And more importantly, move your institution to be able to, to provide this uh, these types of experiences for them. Dr. Acosta, you touched on so many different topics there. I mean, as you mentioned, we can talk a whole day, probably multiple days, about some of the topics you just talked about. But I do want to pull out a little bit um, more information about, talk to us a bit about what U.S. medical schools are doing about health equity, how they're addressing that in their curriculum, <clears throat> and, and if um, the professors are being taught about implicit biases and anti-racism practice, and if not, what more can be done to improve that? Great. More exciting news. Um, I probably would not have been saying this 10 years ago, but one of the things that excites me from the work that I'm doing right now is the fact that it keeps me involved is that things are changing, you know, for the better in medical education. And it's been changing over years. You know, the sentinel events like the George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter movement and the pandemic itself, you know, these have had major impact um, on curricular change. And it's really due to this new generation of students that, I talk, that I'm talking about. Um, and their insistence, their insistence of making transformational change in our curriculum and actually making some demands of our medical school deans of, we need to become physician leaders and advocates in the future for our patients. We need this, and that's what we've needed. The other thing that has changed over the last 10 years is our accreditation standards for medical schools um, that license us to become medical schools. You know, they really have assisted us in helping this curriculum change as well. For example, there's, um, there's an accreditation element called 6.6 .6 that really addresses um, that the curriculum must have and contain service learning opportunities and community service you know, for all of our medical students. They have to have that in order to graduate. Element 7.5 says you also need to address social problems such as access to care. Element number 7.6 is which states it out as cultural competence and health care disparities must be addressed in your or we will cite you. Those are the things that make a large difference for medical schools. So let me, here's the good news. And so in preparing for this talk, I was looking at the AAMC over the last several years now have had a robust system in trying to do a curriculum inventory. And in 2021, I'm happy to say the following. When we asked how many, how many of the schools either have an elective or required clerkship courses on cultural competency, over 98% of our medical school, member medical schools, that's over 155 in the United States, 
98% says, yes, we do this in the preclinical um, years, and 97% say we also do it in the clinical years as well. Social determinants of health, 98% do it in the preclinical years, and 93.5% do it in the, in, the, uh, in the clinical years. And we measured that for the first time starting in 2020. So looking for the future and see how that may change. Population health, 95.4%. We just started measuring that in 2019. Health disparities, we've been measuring it since about 2012. Today, 98.7% of our schools say in the preclinical trips, we introduce it and we maintain it 90% of the time in our clinical clerkships as well. Even systemic racism, especially with our racial reckoning in our, in our country paid attention to this now, 85.8% of our medical schools are providing instruction on systemic racism and how to become an anti-racist as a physician which is mind boggling in my mind this early in the game. But it's these sentinel events, it's these students that basically have been, I think, the biggest spark for this as well. Implicit bias training, probably more common today than it has ever been sort of thing, and it's done in many different factions as well. Now, I know there's admissions committees out there that are demanding if you're gonna be on our admissions committee, you must undergo um, uh, unconscious bias training. If you're on a search committee for a new faculty member or an administrator or a new dean, you must also participate and get trained on unconscious uh, bias training. Medical school has also incorporated into their standard, uh, standardized uh, patient um, uh, courses as well, especially in the introduction of clinical medicine that we call doctoring. Um, and they start in the first year. They get unconscious bias training from the get-go and it's maintained throughout. I remember when I was um, teaching uh, doctoring three, which is looking at working with very closely with the students as they just enter the, enter the wards as well. We use standardized patient and again, uh, there was many incidences in where people had uh, showed their conscious bias and their unconscious bias as standardized patients to see, and they were able to discuss it um, and see if some of the training that these students had in their earlier years, you know, pays off in those years as well. Lastly, I'll say one of the things where the AAMC has helped out is we have just developed and published a set of, of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion competencies and milestones for the continuum from medical students to residents to community-based physicians. The intent of these competencies is that competencies will supposed to and should assist our medical educators in designing curricular content. The last piece that goes along with this is the AAMC has a, a, a group called the Medical Education Senior Leaders. They've developed a roadmap for other medical educators at all of our institutions that will help combat racism in medical education, and that's entitled Creating Action to Eliminate Racism in Medical Education. So our hope next time we report on this is down the line, we can report on the outcomes to see if it makes a difference, if we change attitude, behavior, knowledge, and skills, and maybe advocacy the future as well. So as you can tell from my voice, I'm looking up for the future. So. Thanks so much. That certainly is promising for our future physicians that are coming along. Um, I do want to shift the conversation to Dr. Regeer and talk a little bit more about um, diversity and inclusion in our hospitals and health systems. Um, tell me what hospitals and health systems can do to promote diversity and inclusion. Well, I love what Dr. Acosta already brought up is a lot of these items that are, are happening through the AAMC and through accreditation of medical schools are also happening through accreditation for training programs, whether it's residency, fellowship training programs, and also at the hospital level. But there's, I think that, you know, we talk about cultural competency, and I think in a lot of hospitals, we're starting to think about what does cultural humility look like? How do we retrain people that are excellent physicians to rethink about what is cultural. You know, this idea of implicit bias that Dr. Acosta brought up is how do we implement that? How do we stay humble in our everyday lives? How do we implement these things and make changes and say, okay, how, how do I make it a, re, a good change? So I think that that is some of, I, I like to use the term trickle up effect from the medical students and, and the actions that are happening in the medical school going throughout healthcare saying, what have we missed? Where do we need to retrain how we think? How do we stay humble as we continue to learn? So I think that's one of the really exciting things that's happening is this, you know, let's change from being culturally competent 
to realizing culture is going to continue to change every family, every patient we deal with. There's no such thing as two people having exactly the same culture, in my opinion. That's why cultural humility is so essential, because every case is unique and different. And we have to be willing to listen and learn in every single one of those situations. So that's what I'm so excited to see in the healthcare systems around the country. Absolutely. Um, so we've talked about the medical schools, we've talked about the hospitals and health systems. So let's get into kind of the meat and potatoes. So let's talk about the physicians caring for patients. Like how do we ensure that they are culturally sensitive when they're interacting with uh, patients that are maybe different uh, racially or different ethnically? from the, the physicians that are caring for them. Any input there, Dr. Regeer and Dr. Campbell? Well, I'll, I'll start because I think this is, it's so hard because, you know, I want to be a culturally uh, excellent physician. I want to be culturally humble, but if I don't know, if I'm not asking the questions, I don't know what I don't know. So how do we help people get a little bit of what they don't know? So one of the things that, at least within the rare disease world, we're trying to think about is we know that the individuals with especially a dysmorphic syndrome, so syndromes where they can have different facial characteristics or features, depending on your, your ethnic background, those kids can look different than other kids. But if you look at all of our textbooks, nine, over 90% of our patients are white females. So we have gone through generations of teaching physicians what Down syndrome looks like as a white girl. So what we're trying to do is, is represent these images even, something as simple as what does the syndrome look like if you're not a white Caucasian female? And um, we, um, National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH has done an amazing job. They actually launched a website where people can donate pictures, so families can donate pictures of their loved ones who have a rare disease so that we can see what these rare diseases look like in different ethnic backgrounds. Why is that important? Because it's not fair that if you're from a non-Caucasian background, that it takes longer to make your diagnosis than if you're that white female. When I train the residents, pediatrics, medical students, because they have always seen these same pictures, we have to expand their horizons. We have to teach them what does it mean to be culturally humble. It means you're willing to look at the website. You're willing to look at pictures in a different way. You're willing to look at things in a different way. So I think that's just one example of how we can do that. And I'm going to turn over to Dr. Campbell. I'm sure he's got even more examples. You know, I think Dr. Roger summed it up uh, quite well. Um, you know, I, I think the cultural humility aspect is quite important. Uh, that That's really, you know, um, focusing on that self-awareness and self-reflection that the providers must have. As Dr. Roger mentioned, it's really a lifelong process, understanding, um, you know, that some of the challenges patients uh, will face and patient characteristics will change over time, right? And, and we can't be rigid. And the way we, we train the, the next generation of physicians, particularly uh, to appropriately uh, care for patients with rare disease, um, you know, we, we, we absolutely have to view it as a part of continuing medical education, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all physicians uh, are required to engage in that process of, of continuous education, right? When medical school ends, when residency fellowship training ends, that's not it, right? Uh, there's a lifelong learning process. And, and the art of medicine is a crucial uh, component of that. So, so I think, you know, a lot of it is the personal responsibility of the physicians, but also the, the environments in which they work, the accreditation bodies, um, you know, partnering with, with advocacy organizations uh, like NORD and others. We really bring about a lot of the advances that we're seeing to an extent now, but we can certainly continue to do better in the future. Dr. Washington, if I can add something too to that as well, uh, to piggyback on them, you know, I think at, the, at this stage of the game where we we're at is that we have to also learn how to take pause. Um, to really listen to the patient and ask and getting back, getting strain away from the review systems, not saying ignore them, but strain away from the standardized questions that we always ask as we interrupt our patients every 18 seconds to answer the review systems, but simply ask the, the patient, you know, what do you understand of, of your condition or what do you understand of why you're getting sick now? What do you, what are you worried about? 
what should do I need to know? What's your belief about your disorder that you have or your condition or the symptoms you have? Have you run across this before? Is there somebody in your family that's had this before that you're really concerned about in that sense? And if so, you know, do you think there's a suggested treatment that you'd like to try that you're not telling me that I need to really open my eyes and hear you hear what you have to say? So the other thing, and that's, so that's part of culture humility and getting back to using what I remember all of us were taught in our earlier years with the Kleinman's questions, and there's a whole sundry of these things, of getting back to those open-ended questions that allows our patients to feel safe, um, to trust that space, and to really tell us what it is. And also so that they're not fearful of telling us about maybe some cultural bound syndrome. love to comment on something you just said, Dr. Acosta, this idea of how do we build a relationship with someone who might not be from our same background? And, and you know, this idea of what does quality of life look like to them? What does that even look like? What would that mean? Is it a medication? Is it a treatment? Is it a cure? Is it not seeing a physician and being left alone? So this idea of what, what is meaningful and we make the assumption that meaningful is what I think it is because I, I'm a doctor and this must be meaningful because it's meaningful to me. But what is meaningful? So, you know, Dr. Costa, as I heard what you were saying, just replying that, you know, asking that really simple question, what does quality of life look like for you and your family? And, and stepping in in that position and asking that question, I think, is so important. Absolutely. That's so true. Uh, really just getting back to the basics and proven communication is, is really key in all of our patient interactions. I think that sometimes just listening will help us to be able to care for our patients in a more effective manner. I did want to ask a little bit about clinical trials. So we know that when we have uh, patients who are underrepresented traditionally, as well as patients that have rare disease, you know, they may not have any uh, suitable treatments that are FDA approved. So how do we increase awareness um, as well as maybe um, influence the, the clinicians on getting these patients enrolled into the clinical trials? Because overall, that'll help enhance our clinical research uh, in fields to have more diverse patient populations, and it may improve access to certain therapies for our patients that have rare diseases. Dr. Campbell, can you comment on that? Absolutely, Dr. Washington. I think, you know, especially around uh, rare disease, we need to um, crucially um, invest a lot in the clinical trials infrastructure and, and encourage uh, diverse recruitment uh, from um, all populations in society because we understand that in the rare disease space, patients with unique characteristics will need unique treatment approaches. And we've seen uh, when we do some subgroup analyses from some of uh, the higher profile uh, studies in the rare disease space, there are differences, right, uh, based on uh, ethnicity and, and some of the efficacy and safety profile of some of the medications, right? So I think it is important uh, that the clinical trial uh, infrastructure or inclusion characteristics uh, really um, fit the, the, the needs of the population. I think we have to really understand some of the barriers to diverse clinical trial enrollment. Um, and, you know, there have been many studies, um, you know, looking at some of the factors, including mistrust, uh, some of the difficulties with, with, with time and, and availability, resources available for travel, for example, uh, folks um, having to travel long distances to get to study sites. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a, a lack of awareness on the part of providers oftentimes about trial opportunities and uh, on the part of patients about what being in a clinical trial will actually entail. So it really requires a proactive um, concerted effort, uh, and some of it may require uh, legislation. Uh, I know that uh, NEFQ and other uh, entities have been looking at um, incentivizing um, uh, efforts to uh, advance therapeutics in the rear kidney space, for example. I know the Food and Drug Administration uh, put out a, a toolkit, right, uh, to guide um, sponsors on how to recruit uh, more effectively and appropriately into trials, uh, because it's important across the spectrum of, of uh, healthcare, um, uh, uh, and you know it's, it's a it's a major uh, issue that we have to confront. Uh, the clinical trial population just does not reflect the demographics of society 
uh, in both rare and common diseases. So I think there's a lot more uh, that, that we need to do. Dr. Washington, I would also add that again, this is an important role for our community liaisons as well uh, that have important roles within their community to really get past that distrust to basically facilitate those conversations of the historical trauma that some of our communities may have experienced with our academic and our health centers, our medical centers, um, to help them kind of pave that way. The trusted individual who's that community liaison, who may even serve as a patient navigator or a promotora in the Latino communities, again, are really instrumental. And we as physicians probably don't use them enough uh, and know the value that they have in order to bridge that gap. And so develop that relationship is also really critical. I definitely agree with that. I think that what we really um, should be doing is definitely improving that communication, but understanding that having those conversations in communities, having those conversations one-on-one -on -one could be so impactful really for generations to come because we're talking about um, historical mistrust, but we have to understand that that's not going to change overnight. And so having an interaction with one patient and them having a positive intera interaction with the physician, they'll go back and talk to their family members about that. And, and that can actually change the viewpoint of generations to come. You know, we know that we have certain patients that won't receive certain therapies because um, their parents or grandparents didn't want to receive those therapies. And so we're really looking at breaking down those barriers. Um, Dr. Regeer, I, I did want to just talk about one more thing. You know, we talk about diversity and inclusion, and often we think about that's talking about a specific racial or ethnic group. And I know you deal a lot um, with patients that have rare diseases. And so talk a little bit about uh, the patients you encounter in your day-to-day -day work that may um, be, um, may look different as you spoke about earlier, but they may also have like mobility impairments, sight or hearing impairments and how we can work to make those patients really feel included and feel valued in, in our um, population. Well, and I think it's so important if we, if we contemplate what we were talking about being having cultural humility, it goes to this venue completely. You know, when I, uh, meet with a, a teenager who has dysmorphic features, I sit and I just talk to her and I say, tell me what it's like to go to school. Tell me, tell me where you're struggling. What's hard? What's going okay? You know, I, I had one lovely young woman who said, I just love wearing a mask because no one sees how my chin looks different than everyone else. And I was like, okay, I'm going to write you a note saying you have to stay in a mask for at least another year. You know, what can we do to, to help people feel as included as they can be? And I think so much of that, again, goes into cultural humility and, and just thinking every visit, every time, what can I do? What can I do to be as open as I can be to hear what they are saying? Absolutely. So I know that our time is coming to a close. I just want to kind of end and saying, you know, we really understand that health equity is a continuous practice. There's no singular act that we can do to make health equitable for everyone. And with that being said, what can we do as healthcare professionals to make rare disease healthcare, but also all of healthcare more equitable? I'll take a stab at it, Dr. Washington. I, I think what's really important is that we put our, ourselves into the shoes of our patients and really kind of see what is it that they experience um, on a day-to-day -day basis when they are within our facilities, when they are taken care of by, you know, all of our, of our, um, our healthcare providers at all levels sorts of things. You know, if you're in their shoes, what do you see? What do you hear? Because that'll resensitize us again to some of the things in our fast-paced world and in medicine that sometimes we just have to make that pause in order to realize that and an equitable space is not conducive to a healthy, um, a healthy environment in order to get well sort of thing as well. So I think it's really important enough for us to reach it. I think hospitals, medical centers, clinics, we have to ask ourselves, you know, let's take a step back. Let's look at our workplace environment and asking ourselves, do we really have an inclusive, uh, equitable, and anti-racist space 
<laughs> is systemic is systemic racism, is structural racism playing out in our workplace? And we don't see it because it's so subtle now. We're so used to it and so complacent with it. What do outside people who come in see? You know, and that even it's all the way from looking at maybe the um, you know the the pictures that we have hanging on the walls and what it represents, all the way to the magazines in our waiting offices, but also to you know even our nonverbal communications that start from our our front staff all the way to us when they finally see us. What's the patient's experience along that? Because again, when you do some of the easy steps to look at forward that, then that at least helps you begin getting together as a as a as a group as a staff as a team to basically saying, you know, we're finding these exclusionary practices that our patients and that even some of our staff are experiencing. And that's where change starts, it's beginning to have that conscious awareness and then deconstructing all that again and maybe formulating new new plans how to move forward to make it a much more um, suitable and an equitable you know, workplace environment for everybody. And I'll just uh, add, um, you know, I, I think in the rare uh, disease space, um, we have unique challenges uh, with appropriate diagnoses being made, right? Uh, um, and, and patients being directed uh, to uh, centers that uh, have the resources and knowledge and expertise to appropriately <laughs> deliver um, the highest standards of care. So I think it really requires a lot of proactive solutions. Um, and I think uh, regular practices uh, won't necessarily be effective uh, in, in the in the rare space um, and this unique challenge, as, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Washington, um, about us constantly having to look for a novel approaches, uh, really from the not just the diagnostic and, and um, uh, regular social determinants of health perspective, the art and science, but but also uh, developing novel therapeutics, right? Uh, uh, medications that do not exist right now that we need to invest in their development. Uh, to appropriately get them to uh, populations that really deserve them. So it really requires a lot of investment, time and effort to truly deliver equity uh, in this space, I'd say. And I guess I'll, I'll add the comment, you know, for a long time, we have welcomed people to the research table and to the rare disease table. We've wanted to be an open and welcoming place. And I feel like it's time to turn that a little bit and say, it's time to take the table to the under-resourced communities. So instead of, us expecting people to come to us. I think within rare disease, we're really trying to think about how do we take the table and is it even a table or is it something we haven't imagined? So reimagining what rare disease, what research looks like is this place we're in right now. And on one hand, I get chills thinking about how hard that is. On the other hand, I get chills thinking how many people we might be able to build trust with and work with and, and serve in a whole new way that, that we haven't up until now. So really thinking about how do we change our whole perspective and our whole approach is really exciting for the next coming future. Absolutely. This has been such an amazing discussion. Of course, as you can see, we can go on talking about this for hours and hours. And we really just, we maybe got on the tip of the iceberg, definitely not as deep as we could have gone. Uh, on this topic of, of health equity and rare diseases. So thank you all for joining us today.